Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome to the show philosopher and public intellectual Charles Eisenstein. Charles is the author of a number of important books, including Sacred Economics and The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. He joins us today to talk about his most recent book, Climate, a new story. Very excited for this one. Charles Eisenstein, welcome aboard. Happy to be here, Gordon. Nice one, nice one. Well, for first time guests, we have a traditional first question, which is Charles, were you a weird kid? Isn't everybody a weird kid on some level? <laughs> Ultimately, yes. Um, if you end up on this show, people usually still are. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was probably a weird kid. Anything in particular stand out? Uh, well, I was obsessed with uh, counting. I liked, I, I challenged myself to count to a million and I had one of those little clickers that counts for you and I loved stopwatches. I, I was probably, probably was and still am, I've been told anyway, on the spectrum, but that wasn't really a concept back then. Did you get to a million? That's amazing. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, that, that's triggered a memory in me. I, I didn't do that, but I had a friend. I, have, I remember having a discussion going like, is that even possible? Could you actually count to a million? And it turns out you can. I mean, I feel like I could have used the time to, you know, learn to play the piano or any number of other things that are more useful than counting to a million. But that's, there it is. I bet you more people play the piano that have counted to a million now. Think about that. Yeah, but you can't make music by counting to a million. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very anyway, true. it happened. It happened, and here we are. Yeah, nice one. Nice one. Um, I mean, typically when I ask that question, it's usually because um, there are sort of, you know, if we carry on with that journey, are there any books or um, collections of ideas or, or so on that with the benefit of hindsight, you're like, yeah, I read this book when I was 14 and it really, it stayed with me and that kind of spun me off in various directions. Is there anything that's sort of like that for you? Um, well, you know, up until that age, I was reading mostly, I mean, I read everything I can get my hands on. Um, literature, but a lot of science fiction, fantasy, um, nonfiction, like I read the encyclopedia a few times. Uh, I was a pretty stereotypical nerd. Uh, it was only in my mid to later teens that I began reading things that that confirmed my deep suspicion that there was something not quite right around here. And, and is there... I started reading. Yeah, go on, sorry. Well, you know, I read... Uh, Books like All Quiet on the Western Front, Gulag Archipelago, The Unsettling of America, um, books, you know, radical, radical political books and, and things like that. And Yeah, a political awakening rather than a, I mean, these sort of contested terms in a way, but rather than a, say, spiritual one. Right. At that time, my radicalism hadn't gone down to the level of metaphysics, you know, and the, the social account of what's real and who we are. I hadn't gone to that level as a teenager. No, well, I mean, it, it's funny. It's it, um, people invariably, it's a kind of classic Bob Wilson, Chapel Perilous thing, right? Like um, people can take different routes to that unavoidable work of um, interrogating the metaphysics one inherits. Mm-hmm. So was it principally political for you or did you find something along the way that you think that started that um, wider internal discussion almost? 
Well, part of the journey was trying to understand what's the origin of the wrongness in the world. Like, why is there starvation in a world where there's so much food being wasted? Um, why are we under threat of nuclear annihilation for no good reason? You know, why why is there so much poverty? Why is there why are we destroying the Amazon? I, I mean, I became aware of these things at a, at a pretty young age, and I just wanted. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be satisfied with an insufficiently deep explanation that would orient me toward solutions that are maybe part of the problem. Like I really wanted to know, and that. So that inquiry, which I guess did start out as a political inquiry, soon went beneath anything that we would call politics, and entered into what you might call spiritual inquiry. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of humanity on earth? Like all these deep questions that I think are unavoidable uh, when, when you refuse to be satisfied with the glib answers that we are offered, the, the diagnoses that basically tell us to try harder doing what we've been doing. <clears throat> Yeah, that um, solutions that are part of the problem is sort of the um, the topic of the hour um, when it comes to, I guess, you know, um, your most recent book, um, Climate: A New Story, which which I absolutely loved. Uh, it's, uh, I guess, maybe we start with let's start with a deceptively simple question, Charles. What is climate? Uh, <laughs> well. I mean, I put it in the title of the book because I wanted to signal that it, the book does address the climate change issue. But I also know that most people will not touch anything that says climate because you have heard it all before and I don't want to get depressed and what can I do about it and so on. So I put a new story in the title as well because uh, what I'm saying is different from pretty much anything that you're hearing out there, whether it's the alarmist, the cat catastrophist, the, the mainstream, the skeptics, like there's this whole spectrum of opinion. And the, the information in this book is really off that spectrum entirely. So identifying, for example, and this is true of any polarized situation, and, and and more and more of social discourse is becoming polarized today. Um, but what I've noticed is that in any polarized conversation or debate, the most important thing is to be found in the unconscious agreements that actually unite all the sides. Uh, first and foremost, that that this is the conversation that we should be having. By even engaging in a certain conversation, then you are implicitly agreeing that this is the conversation to have. So you're giving importance to it uh, just by engaging it. And I think that the terms, and I hope this isn't like, I hope I'm not being like excessively like intellectual here, but but the terms of the conversation carry assumptions that are part of the problem. And that's why I uh, invoked a new story in the title of the book. Yeah, it's um, it, it's not excessively intellectual at all. Uh, one of my favorite anthropologists, Tim Ingold, says the environment doesn't exist. Um, and he says he says that as a you know lifelong animist and someone who's lived amongst indigenous people in the Arctic Circle for years and so on. So it's not a it's not a drill baby mm -hmm. drill position, is it? It's very much like what you're talking about in the book. Um, you, you write that. Uh, well, hang on, I've got the quote here. What we observe to be happening in the world says as much about ourselves as it does about the world. It reveals what we think is important, significant, valuable, and sacred, and what is irrelevant or useless to put another way, what we see reveals how we see. And this is the agreements thing, right? So the, the polarization around this notion of climate is downstream from what it is you want people to look at. Right, exactly. Like, I don't think that we should be spending all of our energy talking about is global warming happening? How do we cut fossil fuel emissions? All that stuff. Um, because 
well, so one of the pieces of the book is what I call the living earth paradigm, which explains how this planet is alive. It has a physiology, it has organs, it has tissues, which means that, you know, we could cut emissions to zero overnight, but if we continue the deforestation, the mining, the industrial agriculture, the soil erosion, the dowsing of the planet in herbicides and insecticides, et cetera, et cetera. If we continue doing that, the planet will still die of organ failure. So that's that's one of the, the um, important understandings that gets lost when you focus exclusively on carbon, 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 carbon in, in the paradigm of carbon reductionism. Or another, um, another uh, assumption that both sides share is that it is about whether humans will survive or not. And I again think that this is, and, and so this, the concept of sustainability is built around that too. Can we sustain the society that we have today? Or can we sustain human life on earth? And it's not that, oh, I think human beings are not important and nature is more important. No, it's that for centuries or thousands of years, Humans have done just fine by, at least by outward measures, even as the rest of life on earth has degenerated. And if we could continue to do that, if we could uh, maintain human population and keep growing in our GDP, even as we turn the whole planet into a gigantic strip mine, waste dump parking lot, should we do that? Like, what if we can do that? What if the question isn't about survival? Uh, can we survive? What if the question is, how do we want to survive? What kind of world we want to live in? So um, in the book, I'm really trying to shift the conversation toward living planet, toward our participation in life, what kind of world do we want to live in? Um, and how do we shift our ways of thinking and speaking and seeing so that it's not always about reducing a problem to one cause and to one number uh, to, to quantify everything, which is a, a habit of thought that we have picked up from money, where you evaluate the worth of something based on a number, um, and from science, which reduces the world to data. Um, and of course, the digital realm as well. So, so this is you, you can see like from from all these things I'm invoking now that that the transformation that the ecological crisis offers us is much much bigger than finding some alternative energy source. It's it's inviting us into a profound transformation in how we relate to the rest of creation, who we know ourselves to be, um, it, a transformation in our understanding of what a human life is for, why we're here, and where we could go. That's the initiation before us. And, and, and that's why I, I wrote this book, to shift the conversation in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm reminded of something Donna Haraway wrote when she's talking about this um, unexamined solutionism that we have. It's a byproduct. It is the same thinking that got us here. It is that quantifying and so on. She calls it techno-theocratic. Um, and, and if you look at what the alarmist wing is after, it, it is this. It's, a, it's, a, it's religious. It's, the technology doesn't even work. And even if it did, as you say, it's the wrong thinking. If you can get Western corporations to build devices that suck carbon out of the air and sink it into the ground and, and people can sort of buy coupons to pollute to do that. That's net zero. Right. That's mental. That doesn't, <laughs> it's not going to do anything. Right. Is that the future we want? Like to continue the kind of society we have now, but with these giant machines sucking carbon, like doesn't something in you protest that we can do a lot better. I mean, even if climate change, global warming or whatever weren't happening, does that mean that everything would be just fine if it weren't happening? Or is it a symptom of a, a condition of civilization that we desperately want to change, that we do not feel that we belong in? 
Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love it. I tell you, I've got to tell you an anecdote. I was in New York recently uh, catching up with a friend of mine I've known and love. I, I've, you know, I've known him for over 15 years. Um, we were kind of young together in Auckland while he was studying. And he's quite senior in the, in this kind of globalized um climate religion, frankly, this sort of techno-theocracy and, and, and the urgent and expensive solutionism um, that comes with it. And mm-hmm. we're sort of talking about that because um, I'm, you know, I'm setting up a permaculture farm here and I'm very interested in, although again, contested terms, sustainable um, agriculture and so on. It's not the right word for it, but you know what I mean, regenerative and so on. And I was telling him this and he's like, yeah, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not actually interested in that. And I'm like, wow, because you used to, like as a kid, you used to be. But um, it's actually gone, the, the people that are doing this from a senior policy perspective aren't. And even though that term is, it's, it's self-challenging, um, he's given up on it. He really is a, we need to organize policy on a global basis to have these great factories that um, pollute the ground by allegedly depolluting the air. And, and that is, um, urgent techno theocratic business and and it was a real eye-opener for me it was like a wow um the yeah (laughs) this this, this mode of thinking is uh is quite alien i think yeah um the one feature of solutionism especially when it's urgent is that it requires that we give more power to those who can administer the solutions which are those that already are in power, the institutions that already have power. They're the ones who can administer the solutions, which is one reason why I think that the uh, global power establishment has really not too big a problem with the um, global warming narrative as it is constituted right now. It is much less hospitable to where, where I think we really need to go, which is regeneration, relocalization, um, uh, protection of um, threatened ecosystems, conservation, um, you know, to hold each and every place on earth sacred. That really requires uh, altering the, in, the our system of, in, of industry and technology. Um, it's just such a different mindset than and let's let's you know draw down carbon so that we can continue business as usual that's exactly it's not it that big a, yeah that's yeah. and it, even if you get and and obviously these outcomes and predictions well the predictions are wrong but even if even if greta and exile got everything they wanted the the promise is a techno theocratic one which is like well we'll just build these um, carbon suckers and you can kind of carry on you, your, your life will be approximately the same, but you might ride a bicycle a little bit more. And you think, hang on, <laughs> um, that's not going to yeah. get anywhere. I mean, I think, I think that um, Greta and the, you know, most, of, most of, I don't know her personally, of course, but, but um, you know, I've definitely had many interactions with Extinction Rebellion people and, and people in the climate movement. And most of them would not be happy with a technocratic solution they want to you know, they want a different kind of society they want to return to connection and belonging and participation in nature um, they want to have their hands in the soil and to to be local and to have connection to place and they, they you know they and and they love nature and the beings of nature they would not want to see a um sustainable planet maintained by uh, geoengineering um, they're, they're, they are environmentalists if I can use that word um, people in love with life on earth almost every single one that I've met There's not a lot of really technocratic people there uh, they've just in a way been hijacked into this technocratic um, carbon reductionism but their basic impulse is toward a revolution of love. 
Yeah, um, it's it's sort of hearts in the right place, um, heads could do with some work. And that's worth bringing up, right, because it's tactically or strategically problematic. You write the primary climate change narrative is trust us, bad things will happen if we don't hurry up and make big changes. It's almost too late. The enemy is at the gates. Um, That's a very, that's both, I mean, what's wrong with that, strategically speaking? Uh, Well, like I said, it... it, um, confers more power to those that already have it. And it also, when you invoke this urgency and this war mentality that says essentially nothing else matters, we have to sacrifice everything for the cause. That mindset of nothing else matters. And and we have to, to focus on this overarching goal, this progress toward something. That is the basic mindset of of war and of progress. Those who do not matter, nothing else matters. Those who are among that which does not matter, um, we see what happens to them. They're the ones who are trampled on and marginalized, whether they are people or uh, places, ecosystems. Whoever is in the way of progress or whoever is, uh, irrelevant to progress, that they get ignored, they get left behind. This, so, so shifting that, shifting from say GDP growth to some other conception of progress that is has another metric. Maybe it's not the GDP metric. Maybe it's the greenhouse gas equivalence metric or something like that. That's still not a very deep change. And the same thing happens. Some beings get left out because they're not important. Like if you're focused on geo, on, on uh, carbon metrics as a marker of success, then you're not going to really put a lot of uh, attention on prison reform or homelessness, for example, or even on, say, uh, sea turtles uh, or uh, uh, horned owls or something like that. Because, you know, what is their contribution to carbon sequestration? What do they matter? So they get left out. And one thing I'm saying in this book is that those that we leave out end up to be important after all. Why? Because we're all in this together. We are interconnected. We are interrelated. We are inter-existent even. And what we do to any being on earth, we're in fact doing to ourselves because this is an organism. And, and the horned owls or the sea turtles or the, the human beings in prisons, they are among the organs that maintain a, a viable planet. And, and also to understand that the Earth's climate is inseparable from the climate of human society, the political climate, you know, the social climate, the economic climate, uh, even the psychic climate. Um, and so all these things get left out from the uh, solutioneering mentality that focuses on one thing as a proxy for everything. So yeah, that's just one of the, one of the the uh, deep programs that I really would like to to bring into awareness so that we can. And it's not to say that we should never quantify anything or never use the tools of measurement uh, and control. Um, But we have to realize the the dangers of this way of approaching problems. Yeah. Um, How much is really, this is coming back to your um, point you made earlier about seeming solutions emerging from the same sort of thinking, right? Um, how much how much of it do you think is simply people essentially being captured by a um, an unexamined world story, this techno theocracy kind of stuff? And how much of it is deliberate? What I found interesting over the last several decades of, I mean, again, um, I like, I glibly say that I'm an environmentalist who doesn't believe in the environment and, and in a funny respect, a climate denier in the sense that I deny the existence of climate rather than the warming impact of humans. Right. Um, 
how much of it is deliberate and how much of it is accidental? I, I note that um, environmental activism or even participation growing up and as a young adult was very local focused. And now it isn't. Now it's like nothing else matters and it must be this planetary, um, not just global, but like literally globalist um, uh, urgent interventionism. And and how much is deliberate and how much is, as you say, like I don't think the power structures are as scared of um, climate alarmism as as people think because it turns out it's going to be quite useful for them if if <laughs> if that's the route right. or that's the story we choose to tell. No, they're not scared of climate alarmism. They 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 like it. I don't think that they necessarily um, insinuated these ideas purposely uh, in order to to consolidate more control. I think that that those who administer the centralized centralizing power institutions of this planet just naturally feel an affinity for the things that will contribute to their power. And for example, um, coronavirus, they love the coronavirus. And in fact, the public loves the coronavirus Mm -hmm. because here is a receptacle for our fear that we kind of know what to do about. It, it validates the tools of control. We can have a quarantine, we can develop a vaccine, we can uh, uh, restrict travel, uh, we can, you know, we, we know what to do with the means that are familiar to us. Whereas, uh, say, the much more serious uh, autoimmunity epidemic which is not even a word that people know. I mean, has, has, do you hear the term autoimmunity epidemic very often? Like that is not really um, brought into public consciousness because the technology technologies of control don't lend themselves to address it. Um, so, so the coronavirus comes along and every and it gets hyped up and. It is, um, it's something that we know how to be afraid of, yeah, and 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 that the authorities know how to do something about, and so it validates the authorities because yeah. they're going to take care of it. So they they immediately when it comes up, like the press runs away with it, you know, it it's come it becomes this big thing, even though objectively, uh, I mean, more people die of the flu every year than have died or will die of the coronavirus. You know, it's not actually, I mean, it's okay. It is a serious disease. Like I'm not, you know, saying it's just a cold, like people die from it. It's a serious disease. If if I or one of my family members got it, I would be concerned, you know, and I'd probably take massive doses of vitamin D or vitamin C or something like that. I'd, you know, like it would be, uh, it's, it's not something to just trivialize, but it, but we have to ask why the hysteria around it. So it's not so like the conspiratorially minded person might say, well, they must have genetically engineered it in order to further their agenda of control. And I don't think it's, I don't think that they're actually that deliberate or that competent. That's my main problem with conspiracy theories is that it uh, imputes to the conspirators, a level of competency and coordination that I very rarely see in organizations it's funny so, it's, still, it's still the same world story isn't it because it's it's um it is a story of um how it is a story of the the um even for the powerless like the pleasing execution of power I'm, uh, the autoimmune comparison is well made right because uh you do not well At a powerful level, people don't talk about this epidemic because much like the sort of pivot from climate thinking to a more relational um, one, it would require power to actually change the things that it's built upon because the autoimmune epidemic is EM radiation, nutrition, um, stress, light pollution. It's how we live, (laughs) which is kind of your point. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, that's, right. that's, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, the um, 
the coronavirus one, I think people, and it's a really good example to compare to something like climate alarmism because it, it makes the global personal and and it uses fear for you to kind of will power to intervene even more. And I, I, I honestly, if I do think of it conspiratorially, I just wonder if, unless we're you know not being told about its genuine virulence, um, it just seems to me that Western powers are using it as a dress rehearsal for when like a really bad one happens. And it's almost like a um, trooping of the color. It's like, look at all our military bases and quarantine facilities and, and um, you know, experts in their white um, covered yes. um, outfits. And it's, 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 a, it's a demonstration of power. Right, they're hazmat suits. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a demonstration of power. And they are waiting for the big one and it's never gonna happen. We're, we're, the challenges that humanity faces now are different than they were uh, up until the 20th century. Uh, we're well prepared for the epidemics of the past, and the and barely even cognizant of. Someone just told me that the uh, autism rate is now something like one in forty-two mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. One in forty-two children now has autism, and there is um, a big thing in Scientific American debunking the idea that it's just because of better diagnosis or something like that. Like. This is alarming. I mean, this, yeah. you know, it used to be one in a thousand or one in 10,000. Like, but these are all the same as thing. you were saying. Carry on. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know. To, to, to do anything about that requires seeing things that collectively we're unwilling to see, and especially that the, the um, elites in the establishment are unwilling to see because it impugns their, the very basis of their legitimacy and their power. So, yeah. It's the same. Um, it's the same story as autoimmunity because it is. It, I mean, this is why people, and it's not that there isn't a correlation with vaccines, right? Um, it, it appears to be schedule based. So it's. Uh, it is an immune. It appears to be an immune thing. So like autoimmunity, it's. Uh, if you look at the um, obesity, diabetes as the one disease which it is to do with insulin, and if you look at autoimmunity mm -hmm. and and where it overlaps with things like the um autism epidemic again it's it's the one disease you use the um this is a really good we pivoted back to climate here you make the point in the book that's like listen if i'm dying of a flesh-eating bacteria why are we all focusing on what my um fever temperature is right yeah um the real threat so the climate alarmism actually i resonate with the alarm we should be alarmed on behalf of this living earth at what is happening. To channel the alarm onto greenhouse gas induced global warming is actually, um, it's a diversion. It's, it's channeling something that is, that is global and total onto a, um, onto a problem that is, that, onto a, a, an articulation of the problem that begs a much too small solution. And in a way then it is um, a counter-revolutionary meme. Now that I wanna qualify that a little bit though, because actually if we really want to reduce um, carbon emissions, we do have to change everything. We can't just somehow switch to carbon neutral fuel sources, uh, the, it's practically impossible as we are seeing, you know, I mean, we've been trying, it's, it's politically impossible. It's maybe even technologically impossible unless there is a much deeper change in our way of life. But if we're going to try to power the society that we have now with uh, non-fossil fuel sources, it's just impractical. And I'm not going to run through the arguments about the limitations of solar and wind and biofuels and things like that. Um, but I think that we can see whether technologically or politically, I mean, since Rio and what was that, 1992, almost 30 years ago, there has been no progress in reducing emissions. Uh, so we're basically... Um, conceiving of the problem in terms that are that make a solution impossible because they're too narrow 
and and so I would say that that even standard climate um, alarmism can lead to the same place of total transformation that I'm also speaking about. Because really to change one thing, you have to change everything. And that's what, you know, I, th I think that the climate crisis or the ecological crisis, which I would prefer to call it an ecological crisis, is an initiation for humanity. And in that sense, the alarm, the perception of we can't live this way. This is all wrong. This is intolerable. That's accurate. Whether it is clothed in uh, runaway global warming, methane feedback loops, et cetera, et cetera, that whole thing, or clothed in something else. It's the same. It's a, it comes from a valid intuition. Same thing with 2012. Same thing with Y2K. Same thing with uh, whatever the new one is going to be, you know, asteroid impacts or something like that. There's a recognition of, of a need to transcend the conditions that we are in today. And the frustration of this transcendence generates one crisis after another after another. It's um, one of the things that sort of had me punching the air reading your book, is you, you brought up the ecological crisis. You say the, eco the ecological crisis is asking for a revolution of love as opposed to fear. Uh, and, and that's the kind of, like I'm with you in the sense that I'm leaving climate aside and, and declaring I am very alarmed. Um, but I, it, maybe that's more, it can lead to this um, revolution of love but there is sort of the, that, that solutionistic errors are still there, which is to yell about it from a place of fear. And, and because one is so afraid to emphasize the global over the local, I think, um, because it can lead there and, and, and the alarm is sort of shared <clears throat> amongst differing groups. But it, it seems to me, I yeah. mean, what, what do you think about that? It, it's, it, it seems well, what like I'm saying direction, right? Yeah. Yeah, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying basically applies whether or not the standard narrative of global warming is correct. Uh, this is, for me, not the right question. <laughs> it's not the right debate to be having. What we need to do is the same whether or not global warming alarmism is scientifically valid. If it is valid, we need to... to protect and restore the ecosystems on earth. Even if you're just talking carbon drawdown, that's the only way to do it fast enough is with regenerative agriculture and reforestation. Um, if it is not true, if the skeptics are right, then the most urgent thing is to protect and restore the ecosystems of this earth. Absolutely. Because it is life that maintains homeostasis. It's life that maintains life. So either way, what we need to do is the same. Incidentally, that means that we do in fact have to transition away from fossil fuels because mining and drilling and fracking and pipelines and oil spills and, and strip mines, coal mines, I mean, all these things, tar sands, I mean, these all devastate ecosystems. Even if carbon is not an issue at all, we have to transition to some way to be gentler to this beloved earth. And so that's another reason why, you know, if, if it is global warming alarm that takes you to a place of, we have to fall back in love with earth, that's fine. Uh, it's not important to me. Um, what is the portal to the, the, to the initiation? Uh, which is, as you were saying, a revolution of love, to fall in love with Earth as a living being, not as a repository of waste and resources that we can use for our, for our aggrandizement. That's, if, as long as we're in that attitude, then Earth will continue to die. I mean, of course, if you don't take care of something with love, it dies. Mm. That's, that should be, should be obvious. And, and so... Yeah, my, my concern, I guess, is that if um, science changes, if temperatures start to cool or something like that, then so much of what has been tethered to global warming or its justification 
will lose that that justification. If we've been arguing we have to stop pipelines or fracking or tar sands uh, because of climate change, then uh, you know, and, and global warming stalls, we're in trouble. That's this why is, that's yeah, another yeah, reason yeah. why. I, yeah. Oh my goodness. Need to invoke yes. other reasons. I don't know if yeah. you um, heard Trump's speech, whatever it was, um, the other month where he listed, and unfortunately he's right for all the most dangerous reasons that you just mentioned. Like he went through and listed all the failed climate apocalypses and called them like um, fortune tellers or something, right? Um, and it was true. You, if you started in the 70s, people were terrified of a, a new ice age. And then each decade since then, there's been children won't know no snow, there'll be no glaciers by 1994, and all these things that haven't happened. And right. we and and if this is the narrative that we cloak um changing our relationship with the more than human world in, it's really risky because this, this same guy is the one every time he goes to Europe is like, you need to buy our LNG, you know, you need to be some yeah. of this gas from Russia. And I'm like, so he's, he's literally beating the drum for increasing, you know, the, the, if this is even possible, the sort of fracking of, of Turtle Island to sell it <laughs> to Europe. And you think, wow, yeah. we, um, this is, this is, not good if we've, right. if we've hitched our wagon to this. Right. So exactly. It's a perfect example. If you say that we should protect the environment because of climate change and you don't believe in climate change, then you shouldn't protect the environment. And indeed, Trump uh, is, is implementing horrible environmental policies, including those that have nothing to do with climate change. You know, the, the, uh, uh, water pollution stuff, like like relaxing regulations on water pollution. I mean, across the board, uh, just ruining the environment and feeling okay to do that because of his disbelief in climate change. But in fact, <laughs> there are many reasons. <laughs> like, it's a shame to, in this politically polarized time, to make an anti-environmentalist of everybody who doesn't believe in climate change, because most people have no clue about the science, whether they believe in it or not. Either they're accepting what they're told by scientific authorities or they're rejecting what they're told by scientific authorities. It's not like they themselves are scientific authorities. People adopt beliefs usually as part of a in-group mentality. They wear their their beliefs as a badge to identify them as part of a group. And, and that's why most Trump supporters probably don't believe in climate change and why most Democrats in this country believe in it. Um, it's not that they've gone deep into the evidence and examined both sides of it. They believe a certain side. Yeah. So it's yeah. a good point. And, right? and I, yeah. It, yeah. Like, just off the top of my head, there are some prominent um, climate change skeptics who, like, one of them is a co-founder of Greenpeace, and, and the idea that they're anti-environmentalists, yeah. and as you say, it's a there's that that need to to label and and group, and and the, there's a risk in this because the the solutionistic narratives are associated with a life way that is itself the problem. Right. Yeah. So we've uh, got ourselves in quite a situation here. <laughs> you know, it's funny, as you were talking about, and it's true, obviously, talking about the impact of the hydrocarbon industry being disastrous for the planet, even if um, we just move away from the polarized climate um, warming discussion, right? Even if, if that turns out to whatever. Uh, it's funny. It, well, not funny, funny, but the, the sort of global hyd hyd hydrocarbon industry is itself downstream from emphasizing the global over the local right because it's not just people seem to think if you um if we dramatically reduce or however we transition away from using these forms of energy what we're actually doing is is um transitioning back towards local right because it's almost like the the right. 19th and early 20th century electrification and industrialization I mean, I think about it from an Australian context because you learn this when you do permaculture down here, right? Um, we have a low population on a very large landmass, which means we have, and, and the 19th and early 20th century idea where you put form, like coal plants and, and what have you means that they're running along 
hundreds and sometimes thousands of kilometers of wires like gridded across the place, which is profoundly inefficient in the first place. But it's how we thought about nations 120 years ago that the, the, these things must be, uh, it only, things, nations only exist on a national level. There's kind of like no such thing as, as local. And argue, metaphysically, there's basically only such thing as local as far as I can tell. Yeah, um, I, I, I do think that this is one of the uh, hidden questions that we need to really start talking about is the global versus the local. And, and to realize it's not that we will, we ever can or should completely deglobalize, but there are sure a lot of functions that are global today that should not be global, that could be relocalized to the betterment of, of human well-being such as food production, um, the building of houses, entertainment. Like there's so many things that, that can and should be more local. And if we reaffirm and implement those values, there would be much, much less need for uh, fossil fuel combustion. So much of the, uh, the, well, I don't know. I'm not going to go through the list of <laughs> things from transport to, to 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 weaponry and tourism and um, well, that, the, that we yeah. are. It, I agree not completely. Necessary. Yeah, I mean, and and people just need to sort of follow along and 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 try that story out. It's like, well, if you can walk to a local baker that he or she um, has baked something with um, grains that are from the approximate area if that's the climate you're in and so and all of a sudden you think well so i don't need to drive to a supermarket to buy something made in a factory that then is transported in plastic which is made of hydrocarbon <laughs> it, it's right. and you haven't changed it's weird like you actually you're still literally getting the daily bread um and and yeah, that, but, just, but you know there. we don't have the infrastructure for that it's not a no. matter of just making a different personal choice it, yes uh, yes, uh, it, it does come down to a political decision too. We it does. Um, however, this sort of I think the revolution of love that you talked about doesn't have to wait for that, does it? No, there's always a next step that's available to us toward um, toward a new story. It's funny, you like obviously because uh, I'm down here on this regenerative permaculture journey. It's only been a couple of years, so I mean it's working, um, but it's a longer journey. You mentioned in the book your brother has a market garden, right, or a vegetable farm? I'm not sure if it's a market garden. Um, tell he's us a farmer, story. yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah. So tell us about what he said when it comes to maximum sustainable production. Oh yeah, you know I was there. I I know some something about permaculture and stuff, and and. Um, yeah, you know, he's organic, but he's using kind of conventional organic methods, you know, tractor and um, plastic ground cover, you know, and um, just, you know, trying to make a go of it. Um, and I was like, John, what would it take to really do it right? To to produce as much food as this, as this land could produce while rebuilding soil and just you know, everything from, from uh, organic no-till to agroforestry, you know, silvopasture, et cetera, et cetera, like the whole, whole shebang. What would it take? And he said, oh, about 200 people because it's so much more labor intensive. He's got 120 acres, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we've got five and a bit and if my version of that, I'm glad I read that in your book because I'm like, am I doing something wrong? Because we already need more people here. And if I if I picture the same thing, if I if I picture the sort of um, uh, ducks in duck tractors in between the polyculture orchard with the um, you know the English longhorn cow and all the rest of it. I'm like, I need like 20 people for five acres. And it's funny, right? right? That's, that's what Bill Mollison said. He said, we, the, the problem, we don't need fewer people on the planet. We need more people and we need them like better arranged. And this is a, that kind of call back to, I had um, last week's show was with the Aboriginal elder Munya Andrews. And there's an Aboriginal concept called Yoro Yoro or sort of singing the land. And it's the 
the function of a human is to be uh, is to be literally a custodian and be responsible for the flourishing of the world in and in a in a local sense, in a country sense, right? And that's basically what Bill yes. was saying from a permaculture perspective. Like we we don't belong off the land. Nature isn't something that we should separate ourselves from and consider our impact one way and loss only. It's that's part of that solutionistic techno theocracy, right? Yeah, and it's also part of um, a, a historical trend that I call ascent that is thousands of years old that says that human progress is to um, leave the land, rise above it, and even rise above materiality, whether it's on a personal level where where um, advancement would mean instead of being a farmer, you become an engineer, you know, or a consultant or a programmer or something like that. That's, that's, those are the higher status, higher paying jobs in our society, but also civilizationally, like as a whole, uh, fewer and fewer of us are stooping and getting dirty in the soil. And we're more and more of us are rising to this gleaming aseptic uh, robotified utopia. Like that whole myth is also part of the problem. It's part of what we need to deconstruct to understand the human being differently and the, our function differently, not to transcend nature, but as your last guest was saying, um, to, I mean, maybe I would paraphrase it by saying to sing nature, to sing the world into more livingness, yeah. to sing it even more alive. Like, obviously, like all beings in an ecosystem are there to make it more alive. They don't just serve themselves, but their, their metabolism, their waste, their, their, what, everything that they do is useful to the entire system. We're yeah. supposed to be like that too. We're supposed exactly. to bring more life to the world. <laughs> I think that is that, like, I, I think that is the role of a human. It's that, that, um, it's mutual flourishing and increase. So Aboriginal praxis, I think, is fascinating for this. They, they, will, they would, they can't do it now, but, well, and that's our fault. I don't mean like they can't. This would be capable of it. Uh, but early settlers would observe them doing things like building watering holes, not for humans, but for kangaroos. So there, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, why? Uh, because that's, that's kangaroo law. They're, some of them have kangaroo dreaming. Um, there are more kangaroos if you do that. Like they, mm -hmm. that should be, that's if we if we want an ever expanding if, if we want the idea of growth, um, we have a really like satanic or iconic one because it's it's this dumb version of economy's understanding of, of growth. But if we want actual cosmic growth, we can do things like that. And and we should be doing things like that. We've fallen away from it. Yes. You had um well, there's a similar example of this, right? Because we should pivot towards what people can actually do. This is what I find so exciting about um, your book and, and these kind of discussions is once you move f away from um, fear and urgency and, and globalize techno theocratic solutions um, back to the local. And as you sort of put it like the immediate over the distant, right? Um, all of a sudden we're empowered again. All of a sudden, there are actually things we can do. I've been writing about this, that there's nothing, depending on your climate, but there's nothing um, stopping you from having insect hotels in your yard or on your apartment balcony or whatever it happens to be. You can instantly begin, and it's very empowering, this sort of journey of flourishing. And look at what local groups are doing from a um, remediating river pollution perspective and, and so on. Because it seems like, as you mentioned in the book, right, whatever climate change is, um, it doesn't get solved solutionistically. Um, it only gets solved <laughs> by everyone kind of returning back to that, um, that, yes. human, yeah, that human sense of custodianship, right? Yeah, everybody can, uh, one way to describe it is to make a shrine of the little patch of land that they live on. And maybe collectively uh, in the community or bioregion in, in which they live. So yeah, insect hotels, you know, and bat habitat and like the little things that we do. Um, on the one hand, they might seem insignificant 
compared to the to the level of destruction happening everywhere else. But at least you're in relationship with a place and you have tangible results. And I think on um, a more mysterious level, these acts of of worship, and I don't mean like, you know, this this incarnate spiritual worship, but I mean worship with the hands, with the soil, with the with the life around us to to make a kangaroo watering hole or whatever the equivalent is in the place you live, that is a reverential act. It comes from holding other beings sacred. And you could say then that it is a kind of a prayer that declares to the world who we want to be and what we want the world to be. I believe that these prayers have a power beyond <laughs> what my mind was trained to understand. Yes, I would. I would. Yes, I can push further on that. I agree completely. And it also, um, and there's a cumulative effect of that prayer then, so that the more people do this, it's almost like uh, everyone can describe this however they want. But if we are, and I believe we are, being called back to communion. <laughs> Um, again, we're using these sort of religious terms from a, a different, <laughs> a different modality. But uh, if we're being called back to communion in some sense, the more people who hear it, the more people can hear it. So even if it does seem like insignificant, it is like it isn't cosmically, and it also isn't locally, which I think might be the only thing that exists. And it works. Um, it, the people are, and emerging from that kind of technotheocratic view. There is an association, and it's true, but it's the wrong way of talking about it, that um, wealthy air, the way to solve pollution is for everyone to get wealthy. And that's definitely true. But it's sort of like, um, it's dangerously true because the actual story is hidden underneath it, which is that um, people return to that uh, enjoyment and pride and, and connection to place when, uh, when it isn't debased by the, the nearby um, rare earth mineral refinery um, and what have you, when it isn't debased. And, and that's a kind of co-journey. And I think people, like, we can, it's there. We, not only can we do it, I think it feels like it's, it's the most urgent thing, more than, more than on that globalized basis. Mm-hmm. Yes, I resonate with that. Well said. Yeah. Well, it's a, um, I think it's a fairly positive place to end on. I mean, are there any other things that we want to leave people with so that they can participate in that revolution of love? Yeah, I would just maybe just say one more thing. Um, as the world story that we've touched on disintegrates, the solutionism, the quantification, the reductionism, the, the uh, paradigm of control, all that. As that breaks down, we're left in a state of uh, blessed mystery of not knowing, uh, which allows us, it's a kind of a state of humility, actually, when, when our ambitions fall apart and our delusions are self self image falls apart. It's a, it's a state of humility that allows a new understanding to come in of how the world works and what our purpose is. And we realize that perhaps along with the rest of the story, our understanding of causality was very narrow and that the world doesn't work the way that we thought and that the kinds of actions the choices that had seemed insignificant are actually powerful and that we can trust what we are called to do in our relationships to each other and to, to, to soil and to place, to land. We can trust what we are called to do as being part of an inconceivable coordinating intelligence that knows exactly how to deploy each one of us and that calls us to the right action through the caring of the heart. That in fact, even though we have no plan for world saving, and I would be suspicious of anyone who does have a plan actually, even though we have no plan, we actually do know what to do. 
we can feel the rightness of our acts of service that the mind maybe says couldn't make a difference. But maybe we're ready to trust that other thing, to trust maybe it's the heart, maybe it's the gut, maybe it's the bones, ready to trust that other thing and to trust the guidance that brings us to the local and to the relational um, beyond our minds conceiving. Mm, absolutely perfect. 100% agreement uh, place to end it. That's um, yeah. I, I hope people really do take that away. And, and speaking of things to be, that they can take away. Um, if they want to know more about yourself, Charles, um, where do they go? What do they do? Lay it on us. Oh, Charles Eisenstein.org. That, that, that would do it. Yeah, yep. And climb it a new story. That will be in the show notes. Um, but yeah, honestly, um, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic book. And I love, I love all your work. I, um, you know, we'll have to talk about how you, how you can personally solve economics um, some other time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, All thank right. you so much for, for I think, uh, an urgent discussion and, and, and a really uh, ins inspiring and insightful book. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. So I picked up Climate, A New Story about a year ago now, um, and I've been through it a few times. Uh, but because I picked it up about a year or so ago, what it means is that I had many of Charles's ideas in my head as the weaponized alarmism of the last year came to dominate so much of the global conversation. And I kept going round and round in my head at the time as to what I could do about it. I mean, the obvious answer was to invite Charles on the show. You're welcome. Uh, but there was an element of timing to the medicine that was involved, as in I'm not sure it would have achieved any cut through while, you know, XR activists are being pulled from the roofs of tube trains in London and when the president of the United States is getting in a Twitter spat with a teenage girl, right? Um, and it wasn't so much, although this is true, it wasn't so much that the anger on both sides of that polarization, it was in many respects the pervading despair. Um, something Charles mentions in the book that we didn't get time to touch on was he poses the question of why so many activists end up in a pit of despair. And it definitely comes down to that same thinking that we're talking about, right? And not just the techno-theocracy, but the war thinking he goes into tremendous detail in the book about, and we only just sort of briefly touched on in the show. Basically, do you think you can beat a globalized military, industrial, corporate, political behemoth at war thinking? If you go to war with it, do you think you'd win? I mean, the answer is, the answer is clearly no, but um, very often that is under or non-examined in, in that kind of activist space that inevitably ends up in, in defeat, right? Uh, so the answer is clearly no. And instead, realize we are being called to an entirely new slash possibly the oldest way of thinking and being. And I really loved where our conversation ended up. Um, Charles moves in circles where he has to maintain more respectability than a podcasting chaos magician um, who has and will never have more than none. Um, so I have the luxury, I guess, of, of pushing further on this idea that the more of us participate in local flourishing, the faster it spreads and the deeper it goes. Charles called it a kind of prayer, and it is absolutely that. Uh, it is a prayer of invocation. We are invoking the return of that impossibly complex intelligence Charles mentioned, and we are ourselves being invoked by it. So check out the show notes for more information about Charles's work and his book, Climate, A New Story. There is a companion video series on his website for people who are more inclined to, you know, learning in that way. And speaking of, for those of you, for those of you who aren't premium members but are keen to take those steps we spoke about towards the end of the episode, the Magical Geography course is my complete 
beginning to ending understanding of how you can do that and how it folds into and also becomes, I guess, indistinguishable from your philosophy and spirituality. So that's the show for this week. I hope you found it nourishing and I hope it helps in the full banishment of all despair in your life. Until next time. Thank you.